Grab your Bibles, Genesis chapter 3 tonight, Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to read the first 15 verses together as Brother Charles is going to come and preach this evening a sermon entitled, When Sin Gets In. Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. I invite you, if you would, stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's Word. There the Bible says this. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but... Of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Father, we love you. And Lord, I pray tonight that as we look into your word, that you'd help us to have hearts that are ready, hearts that are receptive, hearts that are responsive to that which your spirit has for us tonight. Be with Pastor Charles, I pray, give him liberty. As he preaches, thus saith the Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Appreciate the opportunity to preach and uh, just open the word of God. When sin gets in. Listen, we know that everyone is a sinner. We know that every person has sinned and come short of the glory of God. But at the same time, we still get shocked when it's discovered that a good man was caught up in terrible sin. We don't get, we don't get surprised when bad people get caught up in the sin. We expect it. I won't you know, talk about the names, but I remember my last church, there was this kid who would just run around and he was getting into all sorts of trouble. We'll call, we'll call him Barry. And Barry would just run around, just getting into all sorts of trouble, would mess with people, would hit people, would, would just... Listen, when that kid did things that were wrong, when that kid sit, it, it wasn't surprising. But listen, when good people sin, it's surprising. I think about Robbie Zacharias, someone who was looked up to, but after his death, it was discovered that he was in immense sin. Listen, we accept that bad people do bad things, but we struggle struggle to comprehend how good people can do bad things. Growing up, my family 
went to a Catholic church, and then after my grandfather died, um, we stopped going. And then our neighbors invited us to Walnut Creek Baptist Church, and so that's how we started going there. That's really one of the reasons my, my entire family saved. What's interesting, that the son of the lady who invited us to church allowed sin in his life and went to federal prison for 10 years for trying to blow up a building. Someone I had known, someone I have known for most of my life, met him when I was 12 years old, was my pastor at the church I was helping at in Tennessee in September of 2018 or no, September of 2013, sorry. September of 2013, left his wife and got married to someone of the same gender. There's a person that my sister knew well, and he was at Crown College studying for the ministry, and then while he was there, he went home for Christmas. Over Christmas, it was found out that his pastor had been having an affair. As everything just fell apart. The young man looked up to his pastor, and the, he, once his pastor was discovered to be an adulterer, he, he just stopped going to train for the ministry, stopped, isn't in church today, isn't, isn't a believer today. Listen, good people can do bad things. Why? Because sin gets in. But the question is, how? When sin gets in, how does it get in? Well, number one, we see the subtlety of Satan. The subtlety of Satan. They say if you put a frog in a pot of boiling water, it will leap out to escape the danger. But if you put a frog in the same pot filled with water that is cool and pleasant and then gradually heat the kettle until it boils, the frog will not become aware of the threat until it's too late. And the same can be said of sin. Sin is like the illustration, unrecognized and underrated until it will grow in strength until it's too late and has a stranglehold on you. Let's go ahead and look at the subtlety of Satan that we see in Genesis chapter 3. What we see here in the subtlety of Satan, Satan, listen, when he tries to get you to sin, he will distort your focus. Look at verse number 1 of Genesis chapter 3. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And what we see here is is as Satan speaks to Eve, he takes her focus off of everything that God had made for her, and he takes her focus to be on the one thing that God told her not to eat of. He distorts her focus. Listen, God created a vast world for man and women to enjoy. Listen, with many, many, many trees. Do you know that there are over 3 trillion trees on earth today? That's crazy. 3 trillion trees. And so you think about that at that point when there's only two people on earth, there's a lot of trees there. But Satan got her focus on one of them. Listen, Satan wants you to focus on the restrictions rather than the numerous blessings God has given to us. I remember being in youth group and and, and going to youth group, and I love my youth director. He's one of the the people that God used mightily in my life to get me where I am even today. But looking back, how he preached and how he decided how to preach sometimes, it made it seem like the emphasis of the Bible was, don't do this. Don't do this. Oh, do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. And listen, praise the Lord, it wasn't me, but I know a lot of people who grew up in the youth group that I was in who had the idea that Christianity was do this, don't do this, 
don't do this, don't do this. And they have their eyes on the restrictions more than the blessings of God. And that's a lot of, that's a lot of young people today. If you're, listen, children, can I just say that God has created an amazing world for us to enjoy? And there's a lot of stuff we can enjoy. Focus on those things. Don't focus on the things that God says, no. Focus on the things that God says, this is for you. Focus on the blessings that God has for you. It's very easy to focus on the negative. We can't let Satan distort our focus. Satan also twists the truth. Look at verse number 3 of chapter 3. But he says, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Verse number 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He attacked the truth of God's word. Eve said, hey, this is what God said. And Satan said, no, that's not true. Do you know that Satan has not stopped attacking the truth? Truth is still under attack today. It started in Genesis 3 and it's still active. He's still attacking the truth. You know, if you search Google and ask the question, is the Bible true? The first thing at the top of the page will be a paragraph that starts, the early stories are held to have historical bases that was reconstructed centuries later, and the, the stories possess at most only a, a few tiny fragments of genuine historical memory. No. That's false. Listen, the Bible is True. Amen. Listen, Satan, in trying to twist the truth, questioned the accuracy of the word of God. Because when he questioned the accuracy of the word of God, he was questioning God's character himself. He questioned the character of God. Genesis chapter 3, looking at verses 2 through 5. And, and the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree, trees of the garden, but of the tr fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. God just doesn't want what's good for you. God, listen, God doesn't love you. God wants to hold you back. This is, he's attacking God's character. He called God a liar. And we think rightfully look at that and said that's terrible satan is evil satan is wicked but when we point a finger at satan let's remember that every single time we choose to walk by sight and not by faith we're calling god a liar because we're saying god you're not right when every single time we choose to disobey god's word we know what god says and we say oh yeah that's not for me we go this way we're saying you know what god i know more than you do Listen, if God says it in his word, if God gives us instructions in his word, they are correct and they are true. Listen, when you look at scripture and see at different times in scripture where God gave a promise, where God said something, this is what you're supposed to do. And then the pe person he was giving that promise to disobeyed, it always led to it always led down a bad path. Let's think of Abraham. When Abraham was 75 years old, God told Abraham, listen, you're going to have a son. Well, it didn't happen right away. And, and so Abraham and Sarah think, well, let's help God along. And so Sarah gives, gives, gives her handmaiden to Abraham. Abraham then has Ishmael. That's not what God said. That's not how God said that they would have a son. Sarah was going to have a son. And it causes grief. It causes sorrow. It causes trouble. We need to make sure that we live trusting God. Satan 
questioned the character of God himself. He twisted the truth. Can I just tell you that with what Satan tempted Eve, the reward of that returned empty. It returned empty. Now, it looked good. We see that in Scripture, don't we? Genesis 3, 6, in the the wind, the woman saw the tree was good for food, and then it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. Listen, there are some times when things look good, and it looks pleasant, but it's not. I went to a church in Illinois one time. I think I've shared this before, but I might not have. went to a church in Illinois one time, and I was doing a rally there, a teen rally, and they had on Sunday afternoon a potluck lunch. And this church had themed potluck lunches, and every single thing for this potluck was fish. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Brother Stenson, but I don't like fish. And so I scoured the table looking for something that wasn't fish. And I saw something I do like. I like stuffed shells. And it looked like there was good cheese stuffed shells in there. So I grabbed two of them. They were huge things. And I went back to my seat. And I just like, oh, these look so good. And I just cut a piece off them, put it in my mouth. Ugh. <laughs> it was fish. And it was the saltiest fish you've ever tasted in your life. It was terrible. I sat, listen, the one, the one thing, before they send us out, the one thing they said is you have to eat what they serve you. You have to. So I sat there for a half hour taking a sip of the Kool-Aid. Yes, I was, sip, I was drinking the Kool-Aid, okay? But I was trying to drink the Kool-Aid, trying to get it to take the taste of the fish away, and it didn't work. So after 30 minutes... I was sitting there with the first bite still in my mouth. I got up, and I walked down the hallway, and I went to the bathroom, and I spit it out in the toilet. It looked good, but it wasn't. Listen, the reward of sinful actions look good, but the reward does not last. It does not last. Listen, the pleasure of eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil lasted only as long as the fruit was in their mouth. And then the reward was over. You look at the world. The world is is chasing after worldly wisdom and chasing after this and chasing after that and, and chasing all these different things. But I think it's interesting. You, you read some articles and, and you listen to some people right now. And what you're finding, there's, there's a lot of people, they're realizing that what they've been chasing after is empty. I remember watching a video of, of, of a lady who pursued what the world told her to pursue. And she was now in her 30s and she said, I've missed it. I've missed my chance to be happy later because I'm never going to have a family. I'm never going to have kids. I, I strove after all these things. And she said, and now I'm alone. Can I say something? That's where Satan wants to leave you alone. Can I tell you something? You look throughout scripture and you see times when satanic forces interacted with Christians. They knew the Christian's name. That's kind of interesting, right? But you look at the times when when the satanic forces interact with people who aren't Christians, like the time in the New Testament when the men men come up and said, hey, demon, cast out. In the name of Jesus, you're cast out. And they say, we know who Jesus is, but we don't know who you are. Listen, the people who are of Satan's kingdom, Satan doesn't even know them. Because, listen, he doesn't care about you. 
He only wants to destroy. He only wants to kill. He only wants to steal. He'll offer something that looks great. But the reward of sin is always vanity. Always. So you see the subtlety of Satan, and he tempts with sin. That's number two, look at the seriousness of sin. You know, sin separates us from God. It separated Adam and Eve from God in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 8, and it says, and they heard the voice of the, the Lord walking in the garden of the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife, what'd they do? They hid themselves. They hid themselves from the presence of the, of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Listen, when Adam and Eve sinned, it was not God that moved. Their actions separated them from God. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death. Separation from God. Now, I'll keep that up there for a second. I want to, I'm going to get a little ahead of myself real quick. But notice... The wages of sin is death, but what does it say? The gift of God is eternal life from Jesus Christ our Lord. Now put Genesis 3, 8 back up. This is right after Adam and Eve sinned, and what does God do? He comes looking for him. He comes looking for him. Notice that when man separated themselves from God because of sin, God came walking in the garden of Eden to find them. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Listen, sin, sin separates us from God. Sin makes enjoying fellowship with God impossible. Right. Listen, our sin does not, as Christians, our, our sin does not break our fellowship with God. It does not destroy our relationship. With God. It does, we don't lose our salvation, but it does make our fellowship, enjoying it, impossible. Listen, there was one time I had a friend, and he had gotten his eyes off God, but I wasn't going to just let him go. And so I made the trip, and I went over, and I, 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 I sat next to him, and I, and I hugged him, and I, took, I, I made him get out of his room, and I made him come with me, and we went out. And listen, the entire time I'm trying to, try, trying to encourage him, trying to help him, trying to, to make him laugh, if anything I could. <clears throat> Can I say something? We had fellowship, but he didn't enjoy a single bit of it because he wasn't right. Listen, sin makes enjoying fellowship with God impossible because we have separated ourselves. And listen, I can say, oh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fellowship with Eric. Hey, let's fellowship real quick. I turn my back on him. Our fellowship, look, he, he's here with me. He's looking at me. He can try to talk to me. But when my back is turned, there's not going to be an ability to, to enjoy that fellowship. Since sin separates us from God, it makes enjoying fellowship impossible. Sin, listen, leads to the judgment of God. Sin leads to the judgment of God. Now, the judgment of God, we have to remember this, is not always immediate. Right. That's right. Do not mistake the patience of God for the approval of God. Just because God has not judged you does not mean he approves of what you are doing. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is what? Long-suffering, patience. Toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you are in sin, if you are living in sin, the reason God has not judged you is because He's given you time to repent. Yeah, that's right. Amen. But when that judgment comes, it will come. The judgment of God is always certain. Numbers 14, 18, the Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgressions, and by no means clearing 
the guilty. Listen, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations. And we'll get to that really in just a second. But listen, God's judgment is always certain. Sin leads to the judgment of God. And also sin always leads to shame. Sin always leads to shame. It's interesting. You look back in Genesis chapter 2, the end of the chapter, it it literally just says that, that Adam and Eve were not ashamed. They had no shame. But you get to Genesis chapter 3, when God starts walking in the garden after they sin, what do they do? They hide themselves. Why? Because they were shamed. They were ashamed of themselves. They sinned, and it brought shame. Listen, sin steals our ability to look at things the same way. You ever have a time when you did something and you thought you offended someone? You thought you, you really ruined a relationship? And because of that, you really just couldn't even speak to that person? You couldn't look them in the eye? You thought, like, oh, I can never, I can never, that can never be restored. That's sin. That's the shame of sin. Sin leads to shame, always. Listen, your sin affects the ones you love. Genesis 3, 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. It doesn't end there. It says, And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Your sin can lead to other people sinning. Listen, I mean, we have the greatest example with Adam and Eve, right? Romans 5, 12. Whereas by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. That's pretty much the greatest example of sin affecting everyone you love. Everyone in your family. Your, listen, your future generations. Listen, if you want your children growing up to do what's right, you have to do what's right. If you're living a sinful life, guess what's probably going to happen? They're going to live a sinful life. Listen, this thing, sin thing is serious. <laughs> you say, oh, it's just a church service. I don't have to go to that. Oh, it's just this. We don't have to do that. You know, let's, let's not give this much. Listen, your children see that. I don't have to go to church. They didn't have to go to church here. I don't have to go to church. If they didn't have to give, I don't have to give. Whatever you do, how you live your life, your children will take that further. It can cause others to sin, especially your family. Listen, I want to make sure that the how I live my life encourages my children to serve and follow the Lord. But sin can ruin your relationship with others. You think about the conversation that night after this happened with Adam and Eve. Do you, do you think that Adam and, Adam and Eve's first conversation after the fall was good? I'm pretty sure that we can, we, can, we can safely say that Adam, after when God questioned him as to what happened, and he said, the, the woman whom thou gavest to me, she made me, she gave it to me. She made me do it. Adam was the first man in the doghouse, Okay? He was the first man in the doghouse. Listen, their relationship that night probably wasn't good. And listen, probably actually took time to be restored. Sin ruins relationships. It ruins relationships. It ruins families. It puts walls in between people. Listen. Sin is serious, and we can't, we need to stop treating sin like it's okay. We need to stop treating sin like it's just nothing. There is no such thing as a white lie. There is no such thing as a small sin. Again, look at this, look at this chapter, Genesis chapter 3. What did they do? They simply ate something they weren't supposed to. They ate something, they... I mean, listen, my kids have eaten stuff they weren't supposed to all the time. And I, 
I haven't cast them out of my house for it. But listen, we view sin a lot differently than God does. Sin is a terrible thing. And we must view it as God views it. Can I say this, though? We see the subtlety of Satan that leads to sin. We see the seriousness of sin in this. And when sin gets in, listen, I love that in this passage, when sin gets in, number three, very quickly, we see the the salvation of our Savior. Let's look at verse number 15. And when, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This verse is the first mention of the gospel, the proto evangelium, if you want the, 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 the big terminology for it, the first mention of the Messiah. It's God showing mercy and grace right after the first sin. Listen, even in the immediate aftermath of the worst moment of Adam's life, the worst moment of Eve's life, God shows great mercy. Listen, I find it interesting in here. We, we see God's, God's sharing so much, but we see, we see a lot about what's going to happen when Christ comes. Listen, we don't yet from this verse find out, found out about the cross, but we find out that in this verse that the Messiah is going to suffer. But in that suffering, when the serpent bites the the Messiah's heel, he's going to crush the serpent's head. How did that happen? Satan bruised Christ on the cross. But on the cross, Christ, again, crushed the serpent's head. I'm glad this is solid uh, construction here. Amen. But isn't it awesome how in this earliest moment of history, Christ points Adam and Eve to the cross? Listen, we see the method of his salvation. We see the power of his salvation. You look at this verse again. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall again bruise, that means crush, thy head. Listen, God was letting Adam and Eve know that he was going to bring total victory over sin. Listen, sin might have just entered the world, but one day it's going to be eradicated. And listen, Jesus secured that total victory on the cross. You see the method of salvation, the power of his salvation. But listen, we also see the certainty of his salvation. This verse starts out with, and I what? Will. I will. I will. Listen, God had told them something. He said, don't eat. Satan came in and said, ah, that's not true. They decided to listen to Satan. And what happened? What God said happened. What God said happened. When they sinned, they, they, they found out beyond a, beyond a shadow of a doubt that what God said was true. And so here, when God says, and I will put enmity, I will do this, I will crush the serpent's head. Listen, you know what they knew? They could trust God. They could trust God. Even though they doubted his word, God was faithful to it. And the good news is, is that every moment before and since and every moment after this, God will still be faithful to it. God has not broken a promise and he never will. Now listen, some of you, you look at your life and you know that you're in sin. Satan took your focus away from the things it should be on. Satan twisted the truth, and Satan led you into sin. And you gave in. The reward of the pleasure of sin for a season looked good, and and you gave in. And right now you find yourself in a place where you don't want to be. But even in that place, listen, God offers forgiveness. God offers 
for those who are Christians, restoration. Victor Listen, God offers victory over your sin. And you can have it. Because his mercy is great. You say, how do I get it? How do I get this victory? Well, here's what happened. Adam and Eve fell. Why? Because they stopped listening to the word of God. You fell. We fall because we stop listening and obeying the word of God. How do we have victory? Simple. We start listening and obeying the word of God. If you know that God has said it, then do it. And when we obey God, God says, listen, you draw me near to me, he will draw near to you. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, by obeying, by, by living what? The word of God. 